Um, okay, so this talk is going to be a kind of continuation of some of the talks that I've done before about Glass Lab. So I'm curious how many of you have seen talks about Glass Lab before? So I get a calibration. Okay, I overestimated that. It's okay. I did uh, put a couple summary slides in there, so hopefully we'll be good. Um, I know that there are, have been a lot of questions too about where Glass Lab is now. That's not what this talk is about. Um, I've heard that there is some good news that's coming about uh, the transfer of Glass Lab, but I don't have specific information about that, so that's not what this is either. Um, a little bit of history. So Glass Lab was a uh, three-year project funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and the MacArthur Foundation. Uh, it, it had all kinds of partners. It was kind of this amazing thing that I stumbled into as a commercial game designer. So uh, as I said also, uh, this talk is kind of the Return of the King uh, version of what I'm going to talk about. It, it's actually going to build a lot on what Jesse just said about creating transformational games. I'm really interested that they're actually going to write a book on this because these talks that I've given before have mostly been this sort of explorational or experimental uh, processing of what we were doing live at Glass Lab itself. So uh, from my side of it, and I'll kind of uh, review what we did at Glass Lab a bit, um, I came out of the commercial video game industry. I started in uh, about 1997. Uh, working on text-based MUDs, went into online games, then went into the commercial industry working on some nanotech action thrillers and eventually MMOs, then games for kids, and that's kind of how I got sideways into education. So uh, when Glass Lab was looking for a game designer, I was super interested in both the resources they were bringing to bear and how seriously they were taking this idea of bringing uh, AAA quality to games for education and also to doing big data analysis on the live clickstream data that was coming out of games. So. One of our assessment experts describes it as, in a multiple choice test, you have three data points that you're getting per question. Uh, but from a video game, you have 60 frames a second of feedback that you're getting from the game. So the uh, assessment challenge is exponentially higher, many times exponentially higher. And that was part of what we were going to explore with Glass Lab and with game data. So what I usually say uh, in these talks is that Learning is an emotion. It's not just a cognitive process. I think of the emotion that comes out of the experience of a learning game as the symptom of the fact that learning is actually occurring. So often, if you get a learning game that is not evoking emotion, it means that that cognitive process probably isn't fully occurring to the point that the player is absorbing it. And I think this is something that we don't explore very much when it comes to learning games yet. Uh, and, and that was why I was excited to hear Jesse talking about that just now. So video games fundamentally are about emotion. I have a UX Week talk that I think is uh, still on Vimeo that you can watch about this. And um, games themselves are emotional experiences. If you forget that, then you're not going to create something that's going to move players. Um, games also, in order to be effective, have to be valid assessments. This is the other thing that we just, if, if you come at it from the video game side of things, you don't really take into consideration what it means to be a valid assessment because our process is so intuitive. So. Uh, then <laughs> finally, games have to be thoroughly scaffolded. So even if you manage to make a game that is a valid assessment of something, often it's not going to take into consideration all the different places players can be coming from and adapt to those situations in order to actually create a learning experience that can enable them to perform well on that assessment. So really all these extremely complex things that games have to do. Um, I am an assistant professor at Carnegie Mellon now, and I often talk to students who want to go into creating games for learning, and I tell them, go into the commercial game industry first. Learn how to make effective commercial games because the, the science and the art of creating a game that is also a learning game on top of that is really quite advanced. So one of the other things that I talk about uh, and I've, I've spoken about here is, this was a long time ago, I'm now realizing, it was 2014, we gave a keynote when Mars Generation 1 was first launched. And uh, we went through, I'm not sure if we actually had this diagram at the time. This was something that was reverse engineered by our assessment partners at ETS to describe the process by which we actually created Mars Generation 1 based on what we could assess. So again, if you were here for Jesse's talk, he was talking about what activities actually already teach things. We kind of um, took that process and uh, identified from our assessment and learning experts when we were teaching argumentation what are the things that a student must be able to perform to illustrate to us that they have mastered the competency of argumentation or various competencies inside of argumentation? And then we built game mechanics on top of those very specific performance-based activities. So again, I'm kind of like launching through three years of, of talking about this stuff. But what I would say now is kind of an expansion on this is that you have to be intentional 
if you want to uh, make a commercial game that also teaches. And so I'm coming at this again from a video game standpoint more than a, um, an activist or a person who is from the change world standpoint. Video game designers typically are not super intentional about what they're creating. They have an artistic inspiration, but that's intuitive and largely subconscious. Uh, it's very, very different to be intentional. You have to be evidence-based, and I know that this is another talk that was just given, which I, I didn't get to see, so I've, I'm sure that it was far more brilliant than what I'm going to be able to put in here. But it's a radical change to be evidence-based in how you create the games that you're developing. I think that you have to start with the boss level, so that's what it means to start from a valid assessment. You have to start from how you're testing the player and knowing that they're going to perform well on what you're going to do. Uh, you have to find teachers who already teach what you're trying to do very, very well. You're not going to directly mimic what they're going to do, but you're going to be informed by their process because it's kind of stupid to just start from scratch. And finally, you have to involve learners in the process from the very beginning. Otherwise, you're not going to get a read on where they start and who your audience really is. So I'm going to unpack these points a little since this is the actually the new stuff. So like I said, game developers are, are really intuitive in their process. They know when something feels right. And so a lot of our design processes have to do with starting from a point of inspiration. Maybe you even have sort of a specialization or an artist statement, but you're going to go to software fast, and then you're going to just start seeing if it works. This can create really great products, and in fact, it's mainly the way that you do create great video games. But they're going to wander. They're going to find what's good rather than starting from knowing what's good. So it actually turns the game design process on its head to be intentional about what you're trying to target from the beginning. So the learning world tends to be too intentional. My first experiences with learning games were I was a consultant on a, a nutrition project for Columbia. They had a, a system that they had been using for 20 years to teach nutrition. And so when I came into that, uh, we went through this incredibly painful process by which we just kept circling closer and closer to just making uh, images of what they were already doing from their curriculum, which from a video game standpoint is just not going to work. So in order to bridge these two worlds, you have to kind of be able to translate between the flexibility of that intuitive design thinking process and being informed by what we already know works and the science, because that is a very hard one process itself. So if you're going to be evidence-based, you have to think about uh, what you're going to teach and how you're going to know that it was taught. And this, again, is the part that game developers, I think, are not familiar with. And I even think that the learning game world is not super familiar with. I talk to lots of learning game designers and learning game developers, and I say, how do you really know what you're doing is working? Are you using an external measure to actually test the difference? Even if that ex external measure is really coarse. So when I say external measure, are you kind of starting with a little quiz so you know what players know beforehand, and then are you testing what they know after? Even if that's five questions, that at least will give you a sort of read. I think uh, when we look at efficacy and valid assessments, it tends to be very overwhelming. And we can think, well, I can't really design a valid assessment, so I'm just not going to try. I'm going to make something that feels good because we're intending to come from a good place, and we want to just make something out in this open sky. But if you get a little bit more concrete than that. You can guide your process in a way that, yeah, maybe it's not going to be like the most robust external assessment, but if you just use an existing external measure, five questions that you've pulled from something, it really radically changes your development process. It lets you get an, uh, a sense of, from the player, where they really are and what's really hard about what they're trying to learn, rather than making something that's very broad and very open. So starting with the boss level. Um, I really think that if you're doing things right with an effective learning game, you're going to put in about 75% of the work in your pre-production just on creating this measure of the valid assessment. The reason why that is is that the performance of the thing you're trying to teach is probably way more complicated than you think it is. This is almost always true if you're trying to teach something that you already know, because the way our brains work is we sort of erase the path of getting to that point. And so if you even this it actually gets worse if you're working with subject matter experts unless they are teachers. Because subject matter experts that are already experts in what they know, they also have forgotten how long it took them to get to where they are. So once you start to create this boss level, this thing that is the performance of the competency you're trying to teach, it's going to be way more complicated. And you're also going to realize if you talk to people who assess the thing you're trying to teach, that there are about six or seven things that you're not catching. 
ways that they might be able to get through your boss level without really understanding what it is that you're trying to teach. And you keep discovering this as you go through the process. So you have to continue throwing things at the player that account for, oh, here's this thing we didn't think of that you could sort of slide by and you don't really understand. Because if you, for instance, are in Mario and you go underneath the enemy instead of over top of the enemy, that might be an exploit when you take that into a learning context because we didn't think that you could do that, and the fact that you did means that you could get through the level without performing the competency that you could actually jump, okay? So in the end, you might also realize that you run out of money before you get to building any of the scaffolding. And I would say one of the big things that we learned is if that happens, just don't do the scaffolding. Just call it an assessment. Just call it a boss level. Start from there. Build something that's really tight and really works and is really polished. And then maybe you can build things that scaffold up to that point after that. And that's part of actually building up the mastery of making a learning game that's of a very specialized type. So I think there's a sense of um, when we were midway through, I think, the processing class lab, we thought, well, it's not good enough if the game doesn't teach. And, and on the one hand, that's kind of true because we have this ambition that games should teach. But on the other hand, it's, it's an incredibly arrogant statement to think that you could uh, create a valid assessment of the thing and then also build all of the scaffolding that a teacher would do to teach a, a student a particular thing, a human being that's actually doing this live assessment and multiple representation and dialogue-based interaction with a student. Uh, to replicate that in software is way harder than we think it is. So kind of like the short version of everything that I'm saying is, this is way harder than you think it is. And it's natural and it's sort of part of our brain to not believe that it's as hard as it really is. And then when we don't believe that it's as hard as it really is, we tend to kind of take shortcuts in ways that we shouldn't with the software. So if you find something that works, that's valid, that's complete, just stick with it. Don't think that you have to do like the whole thing. So when I say finding wizards, um, I think we talk a lot in the learning game space about how much we love teachers and teachers are awesome. And I'm sure that that's true but I'm also sure that we don't appreciate them as much as we need to because the art of what teaching is is so sophisticated and so difficult that I don't think that it's something you can really understand until you've done it. So uh, Michael John was the uh, director at Glass Lab also and uh, both of us actually started to love what teachers did so much that we went into teaching. So he's now at UC Santa Cruz, I'm at Carnegie Mellon, in part because there's a bit of um, practicing what you preach, and if you observe teachers long enough, you do realize this is wizardry. I watched um, a learning designer that we had early on who became one of our assessment heads with a student once, and it was like watching a Jedi. He was doing mind tricks on this kid because he wasn't telling the kid, here's the thing, here's how you do it, don't you understand it? He would say, well, what do you think about this? And the kid would say something totally wrong, and he'd go, oh, that's interesting, you think? And then the kid would stop and he would think, oh no, maybe it's this other way. And, and through this very gentle, very uh, suggestive, very light and sophisticated process, he was guiding the kid without the kid being aware of what was happening to realizing the way things really were. And by asking those very gentle, sophisticated questions, he made the kid feel as though he had learned the thing himself and that he wanted to. And that's th what a really sophisticated teacher does. That's what's really difficult to even capture, much less to do with software. I think we can do it. I even think that an immersive environment like Minecraft lends itself to those kinds of experiences. But uh, it's something that takes a lot of observation to really appreciate. So then involving learners in your process too, obviously. I, I left this slide out. I just added it this morning because I realized I, it was a, a major omission that I take for granted. But I can't tell you how many people making learning games I've talked to that I've said, how many people do you test this on? At what point? How often are you talking to kids if you're building for kids? How often do you bring them in? How many? Where are they coming from? Are they the same ones? Are they different ones? It's this really deep rabbit hole you can get into just orienting on who your player is. And I think kids are scary. Like, it's, it's intimidating to, you know, in the first place it's intimidating to put a fledgling product in front of anyone, but to put it in front of a kid is extra intimidating, and it's amazing to me how often we could just not do this in the process and wind up building something, and then you don't really know if it works or who it works for unless you're involving them from day to day. By the end of Glass Lab, we called this co-designing with youth, and that was not a PR line. It was, this is the only way you make things that are really effective, is to bring them in often, every week, more than every week if you can. So then I would say about wizards, if I could give everybody in the game development world one thing, 
uh, it would be an hour with Bob Mislevy, who's at ETS and uh, the creator of evidence-centered design. Uh, if you ever get a chance to talk to him or follow his work, he's amazing. And he's kind of elusive because he's busy. But uh, being able to have access to these kinds of people that are really at the top of their field and do things that are crazy complicated and yet have this profound respect for what games do because of the complicated place that they come from uh, was really a gift that we had. So finally, uh, there are game design fundamentals that you can't skip. And again, this goes back to my statement that uh, game design for learning games is a very advanced competency. It's because uh, there are these things that take years to master in, uh, when you're just trying to make things that are fun, such as realizing that playtesters are full of lies and that w when you put a game in front of people, they're not going to tell you the truth. Partly because they don't know and partly because they want you to be happy. And it doesn't even matter. You can lie to them. You can say, oh, it's not my game. It's somebody else's game. You know? But they still will they'll figure you out because they're smart. So they're going to try to tell you nice things. And you have to get them to be able to tell you things that are, are true about their experience. So the art of playtesting is its own art. Uh, there's more that we kind of want to write about this process and how you ask questions that don't lead the player to give you the answer that they're looking for. Because the game that the player begins playing when you play test with them is, what does this person want me to hear? I want this person to think I'm smart. If I'm bad at this game, that means I'm not smart. So I have to prove that I'm good at it and I understand what it is. So you have to be aware of that head game that's going on when you're play testing. The game has to have a core, again, game design fundamental. It's so common, especially for novice designers, to build this very sprawling experience that does not have a core. So we talk about uh, the core of the game often in the instruction of game design. But that's, it's another thing that if you kind of get into this without having practice in game design that's purely for fun, you can lose sight of. Uh, you have to know what you can afford. This is about scope. So we talk about scope in the instruction of game design, and it's a thing that will bite you every time because you don't realize all of the polish you need to really develop a, a, an extremely effective experience. If you look at a game like Candy Crush, like just start to really decompose everything that's happening in that experience, in every level, in every progression, moment to moment, the juiciness we talk about uh, that's in that game, the way that it reacts to you from, from second to second, really, really difficult, and yet it's a match three. So even games that we think are these very simple experiences, their scope is massive. And so when you're trying to do something complicated, especially if your game doesn't have a core, it's really easy to get overscoped. And then you run out of money and then you're really sad. And, and that's especially a problem when you have this pre-production process that takes you so long to even nail the performance of the competency, which really is about just creating something that's innovative in the first place. But something that's innovative that does the thing that you mean it to do, that pre-production process is super long. So again, these are things that you can find in the instruction on game design itself, but there are things that would just kill you if you're trying to make a learning game. So even this talking is, is an example of what not to do. Because I'm just listing you stuff, right? I'm not teaching you anything. And that's part of it too, is that talks don't really teach you. They're just giving you this very high level. It may be somebody who already understands this stuff is going to get what I'm saying, but it's not going to get you there, OK? So you have to think about from a learning game standpoint, there are a lot of learning games that are like this talk. They just kind of list things. They just kind of, you have certain key experiences of things because to go deep on any one given point, to triangulate, to give multiple representations, to really have the activity match the performance of what you're doing, to be able to achieve transfer, it's all huge, okay? And I haven't even talked about making money yet. <laughs> so this is the thing that, that really is the killer in this space and that we've talked about here and elsewhere uh, at Serious Play is like how do we make money off these games? And it's hard because uh, making money off any video game is hard. And so I'll, I'll kind of talk about that just for a second, because if you can't keep going, then how are you going to be able to keep making more games, right? So I, my, my advice is to give up on uh, <laughs> making money. Yeah, I'm kind of kidding, uh, but I'm kind of not. You should really think about giving up. Um, but here's the thing about Class Lab. So we pivoted to building a platform around year two. Now, I was tangentially involved with the platform, not deeply, I would say. We brought in people that actually understand how to build game platforms for that. Uh, the platform didn't make it. And the learning companies that make it with these platforms, they have sales forces of hundreds of people. It is so intimidating. And we thought maybe we could do it without the sales force. Maybe that's going to be the disruption. Uh, but it didn't work. And you need to have the capitalization to be able to get bodies into classrooms and talk to teachers and talk to system administrators and all of these people because our education system, even just in the United States, is so federated that you have to do that 
one person, one foot at a time. And we haven't yet found a way to, to skip around that process. Someone hopefully will, but until they do, there's no quick avenue to getting games into schools, which if you want to make learning games, you do want to be working with the school system. You could go direct to parents, but that's really a way of trying to go directly to the consumer who can't really properly evaluate what it is that you're trying to sell them. Teachers can evaluate it. They know things that teach and things that don't. So that path is going to be really hard. Uh, it's not impossible. It's just really, really difficult. It hasn't been done yet. And uh, you have to really be honest with yourself about what you're trying to do if you're going to make a company that makes learning games. And what Glass Lab really struggled with was that it was trying to do both things. We had to because that was what our grants said we were supposed to do. Uh, and we were a research project, so it was kind of experimental. And we thought, you know, we really, really want this to work. The intention is that it would work. But it was risky. Uh, and the two things that it needs to do are in such opposition to each other. Games are high risk, intuitive, they're fast, they're expensive. Uh, most of the time they don't work. It's a hit driven industry, which is why VCs don't want to invest in it. Uh, learning companies are slow, they're thorough. Everything has to be right. You start with curriculum. You get a curriculum that's for five year olds in English, and that's it. You finish that, and then you try to get into schools, and maybe you add for six-year-olds, and then seven-year-olds, and then eight-year-olds. It's this very slow building process that I've seen companies take 10 years to get to. Games don't work that way. And especially if you're talking about taking a curriculum that is made up of games and getting that into school. The scale of it is massive. So you kind of have to ask yourself where you are on this continuum of a game that is commercial to a game that teaches. And I would say, uh, my animation going to work? Yay, it's going to work. One animation. Yay. This is the only animation in the whole slide stack, so you have to enjoy it. Um, OK. So I would call this zone where SimCity sits, and Civ sits, is the smart fun zone. That's what we talk about wanting to make for Sensible Learner, games that are fun, but that teach. And they might teach sort of by accident. They're going to teach things that are popular. They're not really going to teach things that are hard, because the market doesn't understand how to value things that are hard, because it doesn't know. Right? That's what school is for. It's for teaching you things that you don't know and you don't know that you need. So how do you get that in the market in the wild? You can't. But cities are cool, history is cool, so you can make games about things that are cool, dinosaurs are cool. You know, that, that's why we have the games that we have that are already smart fun games. Games like Slice Fractions and ST Math, these games teach, they teach hard. You know, ST Math is amazing if you look at the, uh, the efficacy that Mind Research Institute is getting out of their uh, games. Game designers will look at those games and go, whoa, this looks like butt. But it really works in classrooms. Kids play it. Kids love Gigi the Penguin. It's something you should be aware of if you're into learning games. But you better be subsidized. They are subsidized by grants. And if they weren't, they would go out of business. So I'm going to mainly talk about this point right in the middle, because it's the point that interests me the most uh, for my company, which is where Civ is. It's kind of like right in the middle. It teaches really quite a lot. It teaches without people being aware of what they're learning. And it might not teach the hard stuff, but it teaches the stuff that it does teach pretty well. Uh, and one of the things that got me into learning games was when I was thinking about how much I knew about the Caribbean because of playing uh, Pirate's Gold. I played the crap out of that game when I was a kid. And I have this mental map of that space. I have this mental map of the space history of what happened at what time and when because of the explorable play space and the way that I wanted to play that game over and over again. So when I talk about what Sense of Wonder does, that is our aspiration. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about the game that we just made, which is called Dokudo. Uh, it's a word game. Uh, I also read that every indie company has to make a word game at some point, so this is our word game. <laughs> it's a big market. It's pretty satisfying to make word games. They're people that kind of like cognitive uh, experiences who play these games, so I would say it's a very satisfying place to be in. It was actually built out of a concept that we had to try to address adult literacy. And so we started from this place of what if we can make a stealth game that teaches you how to read, that you could read on, that you could play on the subway without people knowing that you couldn't read. It would just look like you were playing a game. We thought that was kind of a powerful idea. And so uh, I'm going to talk about the development of that a little bit. The glass lab method that we eventually landed on, I could describe really fast, as uh, you find the leverage point, find the thing that is really important to teach. The thing, if you taught this one thing, it would change people's lives. And you have to ask assessment and learning experts for what that is. So you can kind of look at performances on standardized tests. There are different ways of finding what is a learning leverage point. So then you find what is the thing that, if you understand, is the crucial thing to learn in order to master that competency. That's the leverage point inside the leverage point. Then you find the single concept. So for us, this was 
kids need to know, uh, for Mars Generation 1, that a valid argument must have evidence that's related to and supporting the opinion that it expresses. So it's kind of a single concept. Uh, and then you map that to a video game mechanic that already exists. For us, this was Mastery of Pokemon. Uh, and then you begin prototyping. So that was the process we used to create Mars Generation 1 and Ratio Rancher. The method that I used for Dokudo was I started with that learning principle that if we can make a game about uh, learning and literacy and, and phonics, which I'll talk about in a minute, I spec'd that game as a pure educational thing. Like if I was grant funded, here's how we would make this game and use the Glass Lab method to do it. We began development, and then once we began development on it, we made all of the decisions that we would ordinarily make uh, if we were making a commercial game. So we kind of switched streams after specking it that way. This happened sort of by accident, but I think it actually turned out really well. So the learning principle uh, was, that our, our leverage point was, uh, the big one was literacy. If people could learn to read, you can find all the statistics about uh, how tragic it is, our, our literacy rates in the United States. And I talked to a subject matter expert who told me that the actual words she used was, we know how to teach English and we're not doing it, which is this really horrible thing, <laughs> if it is true. And you can, there are different, obviously, perspectives about this and the science of it. Yeah, people disagree. But uh, it is true that if you teach 36 letter vowel pairs, phonemes, instead of just teaching letters, you collapse the pronunciation difficulty of English by 95%. That's amazing. So we thought, why don't word games do this? And they don't. They use only letters. I have not seen one that uses phonemes and graphemes, and I don't know why. So that's what Dokudo is. If anybody knows one that does, I'd really like to look into it. So that was our leverage point. We spec'd it uh, as an SBIR grant, and uh, SBIR, who shall not be named, told us, people don't make money off mobile games, so we're not going to fund you. We thought, okay, well, I guess we'll try to make it ourselves. Uh, we began development. And we started prototyping it, uh, and it was horrible because everything's horrible when you start to prototype it. Uh, and the idea stuck with us. We started to build it because we just couldn't let it go. We thought, we, we think we can see a way that this could be actually a fun game in a space that exists for our market, and yet it could also have this powerful potential. And then while we were developing, uh, we kind of switched modes into commercial game mode. We added juiciness. We added little whimsical fun things. We added leaderboards. These are all things that if we were staying focused on the competency, we would not add. But because we thought this thing has got to make it on its own, it's got to be a fun game, we focused on the stuff that's that pure game design uh, space. And the results so far are that people are playing it for hours. We don't have very many players because discovery is really a problem in the mobile space. But the ones that we have are playing it for really quite a long time because it's fun. And we also had someone who we had no idea that this was true of her uh, was a stroke victim. And she said, I've been given crosswords and word games by my doctor and told to play them, and I don't like to play them, but I played this one for four hours. And now she's going to show it to her doctor. So it was this thing that we didn't think about aphasia. We didn't think about stroke victims. We didn't think about any of that. We thought about using something as a mechanic that was something that already worked for literacy and wasn't in the space that was creative and had people build words, and it was working for her. Uh, oops, I, I got ahead of this slide. So to summarize, we started with a competency. We started with something we wanted to teach, uh, something that was a leverage point that had not been done before in the commercial market in which we were going to release this game. Uh, we built a mechanic on something that was intrinsically performative of the thing that we wanted people to do when they were learning to read, and the thing that was also not something that we saw existing in word games at the time. Uh, and then we built that game commercially to be fun first. We switched. Okay. Uh, to me, this is Glass Lab 2.0. This is the way that we can build things that are fun, it's not going to solve education. It's not going to solve all of our problems. But if we can create a sustainable business, that maybe we can keep working on things that we think are good. And I'm a big believer, or I'm a hopeful believer in the indie learning game space. I think it's full of really cool people. And that's it. So I'll open it for questions. <laughs> <laughs>